Well, hey, no, it's great to see everybody. Um, you know, when they first asked me to come and, and speak, though, I have to be honest with you, I got real excited. Like, yeah, I'd love to go back to, to Grand Junction. And then I realized, well, let me ask, has anybody here ever had like that feeling of I'm an imposter, right? Um, like I really, uh, you know, maybe I don't belong. Well, I started thinking, you know, I go, I speak in, let's say, London or San Francisco or somewhere like that, and I'm like, these people don't know me. I could tell them anything. They're like, I could be anybody. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I can't do Grand Junction. Like, they all know me. In fact, like, Dr. Bridge came up to me today, and she's like, oh, it's so good. It's a big hug. And she's like, you know, Dr. Hatton and I were talking, like, you know, this might have been a little unexpected. <laughs> so... Anyway, I have to be honest, and, um, but how amazing is it to be, to be in Grand Junction, Colorado? Work right here, live right here. It must be amazing. What an incredible community. And uh, to be able to do what you do in Grand Junction, Colorado, I bet you have to pinch yourselves. Seriously, it's incredible to live here. You got the mountains right next to you. You got a vibrant business community. So it's just it's awesome to be here. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Oh, and I see some familiar faces, too. It's just awesome to see everybody. Um, so this is what we're going to do. The agenda is we're going to tell you a little bit about the T-Sheet story. And I'm going to say, okay, like, this is, the, this is the real story. This is how we got started, a little bit about the background. And then we're going to go through our playbook. Like, how really did we build the company? Like, what really happened? And then we're going to uh, um, ask questions. And so the more, like, really, I, and, and here's my rule with questions. Whatever you want to ask, you can ask. And I'll either say, ha, huh, I can't answer that, or I'll tell you the truth. And so hopefully we get some, some, uh, some good questions. And the best part is, now in Boise, Idaho, these are kind of famous. In Grand Junction, you guys are like, why is he wearing a T-Sheets T-shirt? Why wear a T-Sheets T-shirt everywhere? But now these are not like just like 100% cotton, the shirts that you like throw away. These are the real deal. And so we have shirts up here, and normally I huck them at people when they ask questions, but we're not going to do that because of glass. So we'll have people run them out to you. So be thinking about whatever questions. In fact, if you really have a burning one, ask while, we, uh, ask while, we're, while we're rolling here. Don't, don't be afraid to. I know that's intimidating, but we have, we have microphones. All right. So huge thank you to Colorado Mesa University. I walked around campus, and can we give like an amazing round of applause for President Tim Foster for what has been created here? It's nothing short of amazing. And then I got excited. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to go drive by the house that I lived in while I was on campus, you know, this campus. And like, no, it's gone. I should have held on to it. Maybe I would have got a better price, doggone it. Um, anyway, just unbelievable. This is like an incredible place. So uh, I'm Matt Rissell. This is my family. We live in Boise, Idaho. I have a wife and three kiddos. Um, and we've been married 17 years. And I've got a 13-year-old daughter, 11-year-old son and a nine-year-old son. And in fact, I happen to have the real kind of honoree today. I have my 11-year-old son right here standing in, sitting in front, Hunter Rissell. Stand up, buddy. An amazing young man. And uh, got great, great grades in school, so he got to come on this trip. All right, so here's the T-Sheet story. So um, here's how we got started. Before T-Sheets, I owned a little company. You guys might have had a franchise here. I think you did, called Cartridge World. You guys remember Cartridge World here in town? Printer cartridge refill. Well, here's, I had three locations and um, about 35 employees, all at different locations. Actually, a total of four with a separate company. And I had um, salespeople and delivery drivers. Well, one day, I was working late because that's what small business owners do, right? And this, um, this lady came and she shut down the front of the store, said goodnight, and walked out. She wrote down her time on a little piece of paper, stuck it in a manila folder, and put it in a little fold thing and, and, and left. And I thought to myself, should I check her timesheet? Like, no. I would never check anybody's timesheet. For whatever reason, you know, I drug myself out of my chair and I walked over and I looked at her timesheet and I looked at my watch and I was like, no way! She had given herself 15 minutes. What's your like call? Maybe not a big deal. Well, maybe small business owners like know what kind of big deal. We had 35 employees. I knew not everybody was as honest as she was. And so I'm like, maybe I have a problem. So like a lunatic, the next day, I hid out in my truck at lunch. Yeah, for real. 
And I saw a big group of people leave and they went to lunch, right? And so I like scurried inside. I looked at the timesheets and I was like, yes, I validated my hypothesis. I had a problem. And, but I thought, you know, super easy problem to solve. I went to Office Depot right there and I said, hey, this is back in 2005. I said, this is what I need. I need a time tracking system, you know, that I can see all my employees, all my stores at one time from any one of my locations. I can just log in and, and this, they, I've got the perfect solution for you. She walked me down the aisle and she turned around, she handed me like this, this big like metal square thing that you stick a piece of paper into that went like cha-ching and like stamped the thing. And I'm like, okay, so it's not quite, thank you. That's not quite what I'm looking for. So I'm like, no big deal. I'll just go to Google and find something. Went back to the office and searched on Google. Nothing existed. And you might think like, oh, you had a brilliant business. You know, like, ooh, Matt thought of there's a great opportunity. Nope. I just happened to call my buddy up. And I said, Brandon, he's brilliant brilliant engineer. And I said, Brandon, this is what I need. Can you build it? And he's like, yeah, he built me this basic version of what is now T-Sheets. And um, we went, we implemented it. Our employees tracked time this first time. My bookkeeper processed our first payroll. And I went in to sign checks. And she was sitting at the chair. And just like always, she had the checks on her lap. And she spun around. And I'm sitting in the office. And she looked at me. And she said, Matt, we just saved $2,400 on our first payroll. She's like, this thing is amazing. Can you sell it? And I said, I don't know. And this was back before software as a service was a word. It was back before people would look at software and it was hosted online. All software is on a little CD. You know, you put it in your computer and download it, that sort of a thing. And so I called Brandon right there. I said, Brandon, can we sell this? And he said, hell yeah. And so that's, that's actually how T-Sheets got started. So this is a little bit about what T-Sheets is. It is, um, so anywhere in the world, you can sit in front of your computer, you can see who's working, what they're working on, how long they're, they've been working on it. Um, and it, is, it, was the, it became the number one add-on for QuickBooks on the globe. And um, it, so it turns out that we, were, we were, ended up being onto something. Um, and you can actually little GPS locations. So if you have a construction site or something like that, and people move all over, you know, your employees move all around, you can see everything that's going on. Now currently, this is what we have. We have 400 employees in Eagle, Idaho. Um, we have 70,000 customers, way, way over that now. We have over a million users. We have 30,000 five-star reviews um, all over the internet. We're the most reviewed um, software, small business software app. We're like the eighth in the world um, behind like salesforce.com. And then we were acquired by Intuit for $340 million. That's crazy. And uh, like, yeah! Like, that's crazy! Like, anyway, so, um, yeah, my wife thinks it's crazy too. Anyway, but it wasn't always that way. And it's funny, when you're an entrepreneur, it's like really easy to get up on stage or like when you're speaking, you go in front of people and business owners and people are like, yeah, you know, you can do it. Like, go and inspire people. You like accomplish everything. And the truth is, is like, maybe we get a little excited at a conference or whatever. But the reality is, is like, when you own your own business, you may do that during the day. And then at nighttime, you sit on the edge of your bed and you suck your thumb. <laughs> and you feel like the world is seriously collapsing around you. I mean, that's the truth, right? And, and that's what happened. We had four go-to-market failures. Miserable. We ran out of money. I sold Cartridge World. It was a great outcome. I re-rolled the dice. We were out of money. Um, and it wasn't until um, somebody gave me a book. And the book was called The Lean Startup. And if you have not read The Lean Startup, it literally changed T-Sheets forever. I know that sounds funny and people are like, oh, everyone will tell you, oh, that book will change your life or whatever. This book literally changed the trajectory of T-Sheets forever. I read halfway through the book and I went, oh my gosh, we wasted millions of dollars and we wasted a whole bunch of time. And here is the basic premise of the lean startup. I know I, I personally would write it down if I were you, but I am not. Um, is here's the premise. We were using our gut to make all of our decisions. Like we were saying, oh, is that working or is it not working? And, um, and, uh, 
it really, we didn't know because we weren't tracking and we weren't using data. And so the basics of, of the Lean Startup are this, is one, develop a hypothesis. And two, find the easiest possible way to test if your hypothesis would work. And before what we did is we swung big. We had four huge go-to-market failures until we ran out of money. And so we, we picked the smallest, tiniest with thing, ways to um, test our hypothesis. And then we used data to prove it. And so one of the things that I do when I, um, when I help some other small business owners or businesses that are trying to figure it out, what we do is we literally draw up on a board what's working, what's not working. We draw a line down the middle, and I say, okay, go, go tell me. Like, not what's right or wrong, just what's working and what's not working. And they go and they start putting, you know, they list stuff, and then I ask them the question. I say, prove it. Like, how do you know? Do you have data that proves it? And so that's what we did. And what that did is we instrumented Every single part of the customer life cycle, which we had when you're a software company and it's online, you have that ability. It's a little bit, you can track all of your customers all the way through. And then we would just test. And that still, still holds true to this day. We literally test like thousands of tests all the time running, seeing how we can improve the conversion on customers, etc. All right. Um, and now this is the playbook once we got, once we got in. Um, number one. Uh, culture trumps strategy every single time, like every single time. Like, this is why I say that you can have just an amazing strategy and like, Ooh, we're going to like, you know, the Napoleon level strategy, we're going to go conquer this world. But if you do not have a great culture, any kind of hip hiccups along the way, all of a sudden employees start to bail. Morale starts to go down. Pretty soon people start, don't start working that hard. But just the opposite. If you have an incredible culture and you have a team that believes in what you're doing, they want to come to work, they want to work their faces off for you, they want to recruit their friends, all of a sudden, you could start to absorb like all of the mistakes that you're gonna make. I don't know about you, but we might have made a few mistakes along the way. And, uh, and when you build a culture like that, and so and one of the most important things when you go to build a culture, and, and, uh, is, is knowing who you are. There's, um, have you guys ever read the book, Good to Great? Yeah, brilliant book, right? What most people don't know is that Jim Collins wrote that book after he wrote a thesis. It's like a 12-page thesis for the Harvard Business Review back in like 1998. It's one of the most rich documents I think I've ever read on business. And what it does is it helps you just really figure out who you are as a company. And what that does is it builds your culture. And when people go to build a culture, here's what typically people will do. One, they have a culture problem, and so they'll like put a ping pong table. Like down in their comment, they're like, what'd you do to solve your culture? We went and bought a ping pong table. <laughs> I'm like, do people play it? No. I'd be, I'd be so pissed if they did, if they weren't working. <laughs> Why would you buy a ping pong table? And like, I don't, know if anybody, I don't know if anybody likes to play ping pong, but I still hold the title at the T-Sheets office. So if anybody wants to step into the dojo, let me know. But um, I would want beer. And my, so this is that premise, is that people will go and they'll create a culture that they think other people want to be a part of. And what happens is it's a disingenuous uh, culture. Instead, what we did is we built a culture that I built a culture I wanted to be a part of. Because I know how to make decisions according to that. It is my DNA. I would want beer in the office. I would. I would want to, I would also want the freedom to go build and create. I would want the freedom to work really hard. And when I did, I would want to be rewarded for that. I would want to be around really smart people that did not have an ego. And so pretty soon, what happens is you make decisions according to that. And everybody wants to start working there. And that's exactly what happened to us. We created our core values. Now, what's funny is that when people go to create their core values, typically what they do is they'll go hire like a marketing organization, right? To like, hey, we need to create some core values. And I'm like, what? You want someone else to tell you like what your core values are? You gotta be kidding. Uh-oh, I see some bad looks. Somebody may have done that. And if you have, that's okay. But really? Um, 
And so like this was, these were our core values. And now they're, they're not sexy. They're really not. Um, they're just, but they were so meaningful to us. And it took me like six months to create these. It was like giving birth. And then the reason they're called the PBR um, was because I went, I was, we had an all hands meeting at the time. We had like 11 employees. I'll never forget it. We walk in and, and we're going to have our all hands meeting. And I was going to do my big unveil of our core values, you know, and I was all nervous, you know, and had in my back pocket, they were like burning a hole. And I went to go tell them, uh, you know, give them my big spiel about our core values and went like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't remember what they are. And I'm like, well, I don't remember. There's no way they're going to remember. So what I did is I stuck them next to my my, uh, my, uh, computer and I just started playing with acronyms. And then one day I'm like, that's it, the PBR. I, I'll, uh, I'll print them on a little piece of paper, I'll tape them to a PBR can, and no one will ever forget them. Never thinking that like, that would become a thing. And so now, when people come to apply at our office, they come with like cases of PBR. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's not that we like beer that much, it's just like, that, that's just happened. And we've actually had some really nasty notes, like, because it's on our website, like, anyway, um, <laughs> it was controversial. And it also, the PBR, the professional bull riding, comes to Boise, Idaho, And so we buy the whole company and and, uh, spouses and partners tickets, and we all take over the PBR, and it's it's so much fun. So it's a lot of fun. And I encourage, like, I encourage people to make it your own. And if you read it out of a book, that's awesome. Spit out the things that you don't like and make it your own. Now, um, another thing that we did, even starting, believe it or not, and I got made fun of from all of my team, and this is something I encourage students to do when they're in a startup and they're just, like, learning how to build a business. A businesses that are 40 years old, that have like maybe six people and the same people for all 40 years, is develop a meeting rhythm. And I learned it from the Rockefeller habits. Again, made it my own. But we had daily stand-ups where each team has their own little stand-up where you just check in, last three minutes. Hey, what are you doing today? What am I doing today? What are my big projects, etc. We had weekly leadership team meetings where I got, and this is another thing I did, I called my leadership team the executive team. And they're like, that's only two of us. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, we are the executives running this company. But what happens is funny. You call yourself a CEO and all of a sudden you start to think different. It starts to feel a little different. You start thinking, wait a second. Maybe I'm building something a little bit bigger than myself. We had... Monthly all hands. And you're like, wait a second, there's only like five of us. That's okay. Then we had quarterly offsites where we, what we did is we looked at the past quarter and said, how do we do against our goals? And then we looked at the next quarter and said, what do we want to accomplish? And we do that offsite, meaning like at first it was a coffee shop or my living room. And now we go offsite. And then we have annual planning where literally we sit down and this is, this is like a brutal fight every year. We literally go offsite and we plan out the whole year. And one of the most important things you can do when you make these, like that's a lot of meetings, right? One of the most important things you can do is make, I know it sounds funny. I love that song. Here's what we would do. Like meetings get really freaking long, right? I mean, it's just like brutal sometimes. What we would do at all of our offsites is I said, I don't care what it is, but before you present, you have to bring a song. And they're like, what song? And I'm like, any song. And they're like, so we did this the very first time. And, you know, they had these like decks that they present or or, um, presentations and and they would come present. And he's like, I was up all night long. I'm like, why? Like, I couldn't pick the song. (laughs) But what it does is it breaks up the, it breaks it up. And it goes anywhere from Kid Rock to Eminem to hard rap to Louis Armstrong. And one of the guys said, you know what we should do is create, like just capture all of these. And now we have our own Spotify list with seven years of quarterly, uh, you can't repeat the same songs. And what it is, is pretty soon people love the presentations. Everyone gets so excited about about the presentation. That's what I mean. Like, Don't copy this, but make it your own. How much fun would it be if you made business fun? Um, here's another thing is, uh, I wrote this, um, one of the, I wrote, it's called the T-Sheets way. And this is what happened. So, uh, when we would hire new employees, what we would do is, 
um, we would take them to what we call the founder's lunch. And this is what happened. Like we hired this one employee that was like Brandon and I. And, I, and we hired this guy. We're like, maybe we should take him out to lunch. He's like, Sounds like a good idea. And so we took him out to lunch. And when we did, he had all these questions. And what's funny is that those questions, and now we do it with like a group of like 30 or 40 of them. And they, these questions are always the same. And I found myself saying the same things over and over again. And their questions were things like this. Like, what gets me fired? I love this place. How do I get promoted? What are the things that are most important to you? Rissel, what keeps you up at night? Like, what are the things? Where is this company going? It was brilliant. And so we, we kept it. But also, when I found myself saying the same things, well, I started to come up with, like, this mantra. Like, and it became the T-Sheets way, our credo. Now, um, Dr. Bridge is going to shoot me. However, we were 300 employees when we were acquired. And guess how many policies we had? Zero, baby. <laughs> we were a policy-free zone. You guys are like, guys, like a lunatic. Guess how many HR people we had? Zero, baby. We actually hired an HR person for like three months. And she's like, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know what you would do. Like, I don't know. Like, I really didn't know. I am not going to be, everyone doesn't love me, which is okay. But that is what we, that's what we did. Because what, now I had zero tolerances. And while it's called the T-Sheets way, it originally was called Matt's Zero Tolerances. And one of them, like the very first one was, never confuse our laid back environment. Because we would wear shorts and t-shirts to the office, flip-flops. Never confuse that with delivering excellence to whomever your customer is. Zero tolerance. If I ever caught somebody um, not giving excellence, and I mean down to the smallest of details, if one of our customer service people are on the phone and they hear a dark dog in the background, they better be like, oh my gosh, what's your dog's name? Right? Like excellence in every single detail, whether when we throw an event and somebody's in charge of the event and A, we do it really inexpensively, but B, we do it right and everybody has a ton of fun. Um, so here are a few of those things. So I hate the word manager. I have removed manager from every single title in our entire organization. And one of the quickest ways for me, or for somebody to end an interview with me, as I would be sitting down with a young man or a young lady or, or old man, or old lady, it didn't matter, and we're sitting down and I'm like, so what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to create in this world? What do you want to, like, what do you really want to go do? And if they would look at me and say, oh, man, I'd really like to go into management. I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Curious. Do you like to be managed? No. Like, why would you want to manage someone else? That's crazy. As product, there's a lot of managers out there, and that's okay as semantics. Like, you could still be okay and have a manager title. But, um, for instance, product manager. Like, to me, manage, and it's, again, it's semantics. And it's okay if the title is, is, is manager, but really it's semantics. Like, to me, the word manager is control, control, constrict. Like, manufacture authority. Man, I want people who are leaders. I want people that look at me in the eye and say, man, I want to do the best work of my life. I want to go create. I want to build. And you know what? There are a group of people out there that want to do it. They, and I don't believe in macromanagement. I am the micromanager. I am the worst micromanager ever to exist, and I knew it. And I knew that if I hired people that needed it, we would fail miserably. And so we removed. Product manager is another big one. Like, why would you want somebody to control and constrict the product? I want somebody to build the biggest, best product in the world. Next, that's enough of that. We teach management courses, right? Like, this is a, you, I'm never going to be a speaker at Grand Junction again. I guarantee it. <laughs> Especially at the university. I, for whatever reason, I don't know where this thing, oh, there we go. So, trust each other enough to fight. This gets really old after a little while, so I'm going to flip to the next one. Okay. I can't go to that one either, guys. Dang it, get off. Okay, we'll just leave it there. Um, so, okay, so trust each other enough to fight. Um, now, this is something that I brought to classrooms, and I didn't know it. And it's probably because I grew up in a very Italian family. 
which was, you know, what you, we were raised in order to speak your mind and stand up for what you believe in. And when you do it, do it in an honest, transparent way. And when I do that, and let's say, what's your name? Jeff. Let's say Jeff and I had a conflict, okay? And I disagreed with Jeff. And what, what's your name again? Robert. So Jeff and I have a conflict, right? And I completely, adamantly disagree with Jeff. If I take my argument with Jeff and I go to Robert, that instantly breaks my trust with Jeff. Instantly. And even worse, even worse, is Robert then goes, well, if he is taking that kind of conflict from, with Jeff to me, he is certainly doing it to me. And so then it breaks there too. And all of a sudden, what happens is you have water cooler talk. All of a sudden is you have a whole bunch of people that do not trust each other. I, if I, so one of my zero tolerances, what is, if I ever caught somebody else leveraging someone else for their own benefit, zero tolerance, like, like zero. Like you were, that was it. Like maybe one talk, but that was it. We instead, we helped each other be great. We trusted each other. And when you do have that um, argument, you have to be vulnerable. Be like, Jeff, man, here is my opinion, and I disagree with you. And I might be wrong, but we have to have that conversation. And that trust is just built that lasts a lifetime. Um, and so that's what we did. And we fought. We did, like, we really fought. And it was, it was really weird when we, were to, when we were acquired. And we would have, like, my executive team... And we would have a conversation, and we had some other team members join from into it, you know? And we would like, hey, I disagree with you. And then pretty soon, it was like a volcano. Like, you know, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to beat you up sort of a thing. But it was like, no, I disagree with you, and this is why. And, and we would raise our voices a little bit, and they would be like, oh, my God, these people hate each other. We're like, no, I mean, that's not it at all. But in, like, really ask yourself, when is the last time you had a true transparent conversation? Like really transparent when in, your, in your offices and in your meetings. It makes it so much more interesting. You get to the bottom line and you can create, you can get to the real issues and then create something amazing. The other thing is I put up there and I was coming to a university and I caught that a little late. So I shouldn't have done that. But I love Nick Saban, sort of. He's built a great, great football program. And so I shouldn't have been up there. But it's no brilliant jerks. Like everybody wants like smart people, but no one wants smart people that have an ego. And so, um, and the, what's really interesting about that is that I am clearly, and I was not, the brains behind T-Sheets. My co-founder was. It's brilliant. Absolutely, like a certified genius brilliant. And what was interesting is he didn't have an ego. And so, birds of a feather. And so, if we caught anybody that was like, ooh, you know, putting their chest out, like, this is how smart I am, because that's what happens with engineers. They're like, you know, they get in these contests of like, who's smarter, who can write whatever code and sling whatever, you know, I, I can't do any of it, but he, um, anyway, didn't have an ego. And what happened is that people wanted to work there. And one of the best ways we built and controlled our culture is we doubled, starting in 2011, we doubled our, our employee base every single year to 300 employees. We doubled every single year. No HR, no recruiter. And guess how big our recruiting budget was? Zero. Now, in the technology world, let me tell you something. The companies we were competing with in San Francisco, guess how much they pay for an engineer just to recruit them? Hundred grand. Because everyone's fighting over them. When we would post a position, and it's the same in Boise, like they can't get enough. And we would post a position, we would get 50 resumes. Because everybody was started to recruit the friends. They're like, really? Like, it is amazing. I get to work hard. I don't have somebody just beating, browbeating me. Um, look at what I created. And for software engineers, they got to release code in real time. And so we, they would release code, and all of a sudden, it would roll out to hundreds of thousands of people across the world. They'd be like, oh, this is amazing. And then they'd go recruit their best buddies. All right. Another thing um, is drink your own champagne, which most people say, like, do you eat, do you eat your own dog food? Right? But we didn't like dog food very much, so we changed that to drink your own champagne. And because I like champagne a lot more than dog food. And um, but really, when it, your own product, when is the last time you used your own product? And sometimes when you have a service, it's a little bit difficult. But one of the things that we mandated 
is that everyone used the product and what happened is if it doesn't work and it doesn't work the way you want it to work, guess what? You're gonna change it really fast. And that helped us iterate so quickly. And now, like people ask me, um, because in, in, especially in Idaho and in, in California, with our partnership with Intuit it was very public. What did you guys do? And what's interesting is like for the entrepreneurs out there is when you're a small little company, you try to partner with a really big company like Intuit, that is not an easy thing to navigate, right? Because you have this big partner that has all this leverage over you and you, you have to make sure that you don't put yourself too subject to all of their big moves, right? And so um, here's what we did. We found out what was most important. This is not rocket science, but we found out what was most important to Intuit. And what was interesting is we, and I mean that sincerely, and on an individual level. Like, so when we went to build a relationship, we found out, like, the partnership people, we found out exactly how they were measured their success, and we found out how to tailor what we did to their success. Mid-level managers, same thing. All the way up into the CEO, and we became so integrated that we became um, the number one add-on for QuickBooks. Before we were acquired, in fact, they actually, you might have used T-Sheets, they embedded our functionality inside of QuickBooks, and you didn't even know you were using it. Like, it was crazy. And then they came, and they acquired us. Okay. Um, now, um, if this is, if you've ever been to uh, Telluride Airport, so this is the Telluride Airport. And I don't know if you have been there, but it has a cliff on both sides. And when you are an entrepreneur, um, there are a lot of times when you get started, when you're like, oh my gosh, am I gonna make it? And if you will see here that this pilot doesn't look like he's off the ground, but guess what's on the other side? Nothing but a cliff. And it literally, the lights, you can't see it very well, but it is nothing, you can't have a commercial flight that goes in there anymore. And when you're an entrepreneur, and um, you are like in a position we were in, where we got just a little bit of publicity, like at the very, very beginning, of T-sheets, and so they wrote a little article on us, and we were so excited, and this is like, we had like six employees or something like that, and what we, we, we were celebrating, we went back in, and we looked at the comments at the bottom of this article, and the comments were this, oh, mobile time tracking, question mark, never period, will period, work period, worst idea I've seen today, I've been in business, for 30 years, this is a for sure fail. No kidding. All capital letters, have you ever seen like the fail blog? They said perfect for fail.com. Um, really. And meanwhile, we were hemorrhaging, like we were running out of money. My buddy and I, uh, my, my co founder and I, we, we just were like, we were, we were devastated. My buddies in my own hometown in Boise that I knew, they were looking at me like, they go, Rissle, time tracking? I mean, couldn't you come up with a better idea? Like, this is terrible. And so we went outside, and we, we laid on the grass. We stared up at the stars, or at the, at the sky, and we just like, does anybody care about time tracking? Like, will this ever, will this ever work? And we're like, you know what? We're only a couple months from being out of money. Maybe we should shut the company down. Like, really, maybe we should just shut this thing down. We could be making a whole lot more money out there in the market. Like, maybe we should. And if we said, you know what? Let's just sleep on it. So we went home and um, came back in the next day. And I'm like, Brandon, what do you think? And he's like, man, I still believe. I'm like, me too. And we never, and we never asked that question ever again. And so never, never let somebody else tell you when to quit. Like, that is your decision. That is your decision alone. In fact, when people tell me, <laughs> Matt, you should go whatever. I tell them to go should on someone else. And that night, and that night, when Brandon and I almost shut down the company, I went home, and I told my wife, of course, like, you know, we're thinking about shutting this thing down. What have I done to my family? We just had all this money. We just re-rolled it. Like, what am I doing? And my wife looked at me. She said, you know, whether we're, staying, we're, whether we're in a mansion or whether we're in a cardboard box, um, I'll follow you anywhere in the world. And I came home that day and still in our, our, uh, our laundry room, right when you walk in from the garage and it's still there today, um, there is a sign that, that she made, had, the, had our little toddlers at the time and said, Daddy, we still believe in you. And so when you go start your company, know that it's not going to be easy. 
and, and there's going to be a whole lot of people, even friends, that either get jealous or they're, or they're trying to protect you. Um, and they have their best interest in mind, they think, and they tell you when to quit. But no one gets to tell you when to quit because that is your decision and your decision alone. And that's it. All right. Thank you.